Hello and good morning and welcome to another Euros Match Day Roundup. I'm Jack from Ref Coach, and once again I'm joined by Ale from Ref Coach. Good morning, Ale. Daniele Hi, from man. Referee Abroad. Good evening, Daniele. And Sam from Ref Six. Good evening, mate. How are we guys? Doing well, thank you. How are you? Good. It's 7 a.m. on a Sunday, so I haven't seen 7 a.m. on a Sunday for a while, but good to be here <laughs> recapping everything that's happened. I know Ale's been glued to his Optus Sport, watching <laughs> every game, the, the technical analysis of everything, watching Italy qualify already after two games. I know he's a happy man. Oh, how, can, how could I not? We have been, we have been amazing so far. So. <laughs> and England. Not so much disappointing result against Scotland, but hopefully draw or win against the Czechs will see us through, win the group without conceding a goal, and and onwards we go. Or or maybe not win the group and uh, have a little bit of an easier route. Who knows? We'll see. Well, what is what is the route? So if England win the group, who do they play? I know runner up is France, isn't it? It's it. No, 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 no. If we if England win, it will be the runners up of the France, Portugal, Germany. Hungary group. So uh, that's the route if we win. Well, that's a nightmare anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and if we come second, it's a completely different route, a lot more, um, a, a little bit easier. Although that being said, if Spain finish second, I think it's Spain. I think actually we play the second team in Spain's group. If Spain comes second, then it will be Spain. So Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. But actually, what Spain the last couple of games, I would probably take that over. Yeah, oh yeah, you would definitely take them there, and they struggled this morning as well. Um, one of them, there was a non-field review; they missed the penalty, so they they're not looking to Spain that you know won thirty-five in a row or whatever it was. Yeah. So. Well, that's so like yeah. nicely, Ale, into um, how's the refereeing been? Obviously, we're all very complimentary of the refereeing in match day one. I think everybody has said the standard has been incredibly high. I saw some English pundits who are usually incredibly critical of referees were uh, saying how good the tournament was, how well VAR had been implemented, which was a shock for me. <laughs> what did you guys think? I think much the same, personally. I think, I think the second... Games have uh, had a lot more incidents in them, and I think that's just the nature of you know games with a little bit more on the line now because all of a sudden yeah. the uh, teams are less tense. You know they need to actually win games if they've lost them in the first round, so there's more been more incidents. But overall, I would say the standard's still as high as it was in match day one. Yeah. There's been a couple of games. The, the, the game this morning, Daniel and I were commenting just before, um, Orsato, um, you know, a, a good old mate from Italy. He wasn't as, as polished as usual, uh, I would say. It was a really scrap, scrappy game. Uh, I think there's been a couple of games where, um, you know, the Cerro Grande had some difficulties. But as you said, Asana, also considering that the, the, the best third are going to go through you know, even in the next round, there's going to be a lot more pressure and it's going to be really hard to see any dead rubber uh, yeah. because of this, this way of qualifying. So There'll it's basically be no dead rubbers, right? Mm? There'll basically be no dead rubber games. Basically Every not, yeah. It's going to have an, some in riding on it, whether it's finishing first or second. I might be completely wrong, but I think there's only one team that can't qualify. Which is North Macedonia, I believe. Which, yeah, so that means yeah. every single game has something on it. There's no dead rovers. Yeah, exactly. Which is not, I would imagine, speculating, but not what UEFA would have wanted, uh, given they have the fourth yeah. officials panel, etc. They want to, you know, they, if there's a dead rubber, they want to maybe give for Per a game or one of uh, the, the other. other the other, the other team that is out, Hassan, is Turkey. Ah, very true. Yeah, I yeah, think, yeah, uh, I think yeah. Wales group. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I can say something on, on the refereeing, since you asked, um, I think this second uh, second match day has been quiet, not much to talk about. Um, so this this is good news for Wafer, because mm -hmm. when you don't speak about the referee, uh, it means you've had a good good game. Um, it, I think there were a couple of good surprises. 
um, one was with uh, with Rapallini, the Argentinian referee, of course. Mm, yeah. um, was, uh, we were all talking about um, uh, how it would adapt to the European game. And I think, okay, the game wasn't uh, the most important, but uh, I think he did quite well. And it was very, his personality and, and, and uh, body language was excellent, uh, as you would expect from a South American referee. So I think this was a very good um, uh, trial for him ahead of the, of the World Cup next year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other very good surprise, which we had in the first match day already, but he confirmed himself, uh, is Daniel Siebert, the, yeah. young German, the young German referee who's uh, one of the only two Category 1s selected. He's only 36, I believe, so he's very young. And after an excellent game in the first match day, he's had another excellent game in the second match day. So um, I can definitely say that uh, regardless of what uh, Felix Brake will do, um, whether he will continue refereeing or not, uh, German refereeing has, has found his... Uh, his uh, successor. Uh, next, his yeah. successor is ne his next top referee. And not to forget, yeah, they, not to, to forget, they have also Steeler and others. But uh, yeah, so hats off, hats off to both uh, Rapalini and uh, and the Steeler. Eh, sorry, and Siebert. Yeah. Very good. All right. Well, let's get back to the Euros. Let's um, crack into uh, the analysis of some incidents. We're going to keep things a little bit shorter than we did yeah. after the first match day. Try and keep it a bit more condensed. So. I'll lay over to you to kick this one off. So, a few more cards, actually. We almost doubled the number of cards in this round, <clears throat> which really it shows how much more important um, the, the games are getting, how much more pressure there is on teams. Uh, zero red cards this time around. Um, in forum field reviews, so we went from zero in the first match day to four. Uh, which was interesting. So, you know, we started seeing VAR, but as, as you guys said before, it's been used really well. And I think, I hope personally, this is going to be the way we'll be, we'll see VAR and refereeing uh, being approached in the next season internationally as well, because it's been really, really good. Um, so because we had 41 yellow cards, obviously we're not going to go through all of it. <laughs> Otherwise we'll be here until tomorrow. Uh, but we picked that some of the main um, incidents so the first game we go through it's Turkey Whale, Arthur Diaz. Um, I remember getting up to rewatch that game and getting a text from Daniela saying he did really well, uh, which he did. Uh, it was a really tough game. And just to show you, this was a potential yellow card straight in the second minute. And there was another few um, episodes like this. So as we can see, it's a cl classic kick studs on foot. Uh, but Arthur Diaz did really well in management with the game to start with. Um, and saved a few cards like this. So that really helped him in managing the game. I think this uh, is becoming a theme, Ale, just on that note. Yes. Because we talked about it a bit last time, whereas, you know, what we're coaching the A-League, any studs on foot, black and white, it's a yellow card, basically. Um, simple as that. Whereas UEFA are obviously taking a more um, lenient approach to it for one reason or another, which is just interesting between the different stars. Yeah. Oh, very true, and I'm glad you said that because it, we're going to see that even in in all other games, that's exactly what's been happening. Um, I found this interesting, just to point out, there was these two couple of handballs very close to each other. The left one is obviously a handball, even though it's a bit blurry, you can see the hand up stretched. On the right side, you can see the, the hand close to the body, a consequence of the movement of the player falling. So I thought because of the new laws, it was interesting to sort of Look at this, and obviously the right one was a no handball, even though the Wales players wanted a penalty for that, but was correctly not given by Arthur Diaz. Um, then we had a, ye a yellow card, um, actually a missed yellow card for this incident. Um, mm -hmm. we, we spoke about illegal use of arms in the first match day, uh, which happened quite a lot. And ma match day two, again, was a big, big thing. Um, this was a situation where the Wales player, again, simply used his arm as a tool, not as a weapon. So a reckless challenge, a yellow card would have sufficed. Um, very straightforward. Now, one of the interesting episodes of this round, the penalty. Um, Arthur Diaz gave it straight away. As we can see, it's a clear trip. 
uh, and was just inside the penalty area. This so was very was very yeah. tricky because it, it you know in live motion this could have been mm -hmm. outside inside. So the fact yeah. that the fact that he got it straight away yeah. and he didn't need VAR to to step in is incredible. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, yeah. To be slightly cynical to say it's incredible, you look at where the referee is. Right. Yeah, he's in a good position, but. Look, it's hard to say without seeing the video. It could have been a quick break, etc. But in terms of those in and out decisions, I've always been coached or given some coaching. I'm like, if you go, so this ref would this have been three metres further to the left. He could have looked straight down the line. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you see it in the EPL a bit, especially Michael Oliver. They make it really obvious that they're looking straight down the line. Like Oliver almost does that kind of weird squat thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Good point. And, so just a bit of potential coaching around that for any younger referees listening. If you want to be able to sell the in and out decisions, if you can be dead in line with it, it allows you to to have that perfect view. Mm -hmm. But yes, in this instance, obviously the referee got it right and an incredibly tight one. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, went in to, to do a quick check, confirm the decision, happy days. Um, something we've seen a lot more in the second round. Uh, so this was a bit of a bit of a shamble um, in the 90th minute. Um, I put a lot of shots, so I can simply talk you through this. Happened at the end of the game. Uh, there's been a lot of crowding in this second match day. Uh, again, because of the pressure of the games increasing. So there was there was some contact between the Turkey player here in the first slide between the Turkey player and uh, a Wales player, uh, and then the Turkey player goes and like puts his hand on the chin of his opponent. So obviously the Wales players kind of lost it a bit and we're like what's going on to push him down and then there was a bit of an all-in um we can see the assistant referee coming in from the other side to to help with the melee uh and then something really bad that unfortunately was missed by the referees and should have been picked up by bar by VAR happened so number 10 Chalanolo in this screen you can see how he's loading his elbow and then he just whacks the 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 Wales player in the guts that should have been a red card. Um, almost impossible to see live from the refereeing team because it was just there was so much happening. Because uh, obviously, when you have an all in, you have to try and see everything. But especially there was three, four player pushing Chalonalo around, but the whack was quite obvious. Um, probably hard to see from out of the from the other side. VR should have probably intervened because this was a serious missed incident um, and was a red card. So there was no intervention. In the end of the game, I wonder if maybe there was some thinking of, oh, maybe we let, let it go, get away with it. It was a big goal in. Um, it was just... Yeah, it gave four yellows at once. It's pretty, that's highly unusual. Yeah, that, that is highly unusual. Yeah, it's true. Usually you see the one and one, but it was such a big melee. As, I don't know if you guys, Daniela and Asan, did you, if you if you saw it live, uh, and what did you think of it? You know what? I didn't see it live, and I'm trying to quickly on my phone find a find a video so and give you some comments. But uh, unfortunately, there's a few highlights from uh, from UEFA and ITV, etc. Yeah. Don't actually uh, have have uh, skipped over it. I watched I watched um, I watched the game intermittently. Um, I missed this this, uh, this bit, but uh, I yeah. thought the refereeing was um, very very good in the game. So yeah, a shame if 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 you're correct in saying that there's a misread. It's a shame uh, shame that that's happened. But uh, yeah, and you know what? Uh, and I, I, always... I think we're going to see a lot more of this in match day three, right? A lot more mm. high pressure situations. Turkey have realised obviously that they're going out. Uh, look at the time in in the in the game, and so you're going to see a lot of hot-headed um, reactions from players. Uh, a lot more now. The tournament's getting juicier. Yeah, especially if you look at the game, Turkey Wales. You know, Turkey now is out. So yeah. Turkey, they were they were playing to win it, and they were down one nil in the 90th minute. So of course, they would have been really hot-headed. I I think I didn't see it live. Uh, but uh, you know, so the highlights just just like you. Um, I and I think, as, as I said to you when before you watched it, I think DS did a did a very good job. Yeah. Um, 
I think it was the right appointment for this kind of game. You know, he's a Portuguese referee. He's used to hot temper. And um, he did, did, did very well. I mean, um, I can't really comment on this specific episode, but I think he's one of the referees that has done incredibly well this season, um, even in, in, the, in, in Europe, in the Champions League and Europa League. Uh, so he definitely deserves, uh, deserves uh, to be there. And, and he showed, uh, showed everybody's quality. So I, yeah. I expect him to be one of uh, the referees that, that will play a role in the next rounds as well. Yeah, I do agree. Um, as Hassan said as well, like you know, it's one decision, and it's a shame because he had such a good game. The whole team they managed the game really well, um, but one decision like this, especially, it can happen. It, as we we know as referees, it can happen. So it's not a massive deal, um, all in all. And there was not much noise about it. There's not been much talking about it. Um, so happy days. Summed up nicely. On to the next. It's On to the time. next. Italy, Switzerland, Sergei Karasev. Um, a, good, a, a, a positive surprise. Yeah. A game that didn't really have much to talk about, in all, in all, in all honesty. There was an initial, some, some people called for a simulation for this um, initial um, penalty area incident where Insigne sort of lost his balance a bit and went down. As we can see, there's no contact at all. Um, but Insigne didn't even... Um, appeal for a penalty, he just went down and got back up straight away, so it's more a case, I think, of losing the balance and Karazev read it well, he was in a great position for this, came up with the right decision, so um, good good on Karazev for that um, biggest incident of this game was this uh, which is quite interesting, because um, so what happened, as you can see in the two smaller screenshots, is a goal was scored after a handball which was an accidental is that, is that handball is that yeah. Chilean, how we say, it? that's it, heading into his own arm, right? Yeah, so Chiellini heads the ball into his own arm, and then the, the ball goes right arm and left arm goes down, and then Chiellini kicks the ball into the goal. Um, so this was quite interesting, because obviously the law that about attacking a ball has been kind of scrapped. The only valid point in the, uh, in the laws now is if a goal is scored immediately after, or if a, a goal is scored off, off a hand, that's when. Is this not immediate, goal... Ali? Yeah, this is immediate. Oh, I was about, yeah, I was going to say, obviously, yeah. obviously, like I said last time, not up to date with the current changes for all these reasons, but yeah, this seems immediate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it happens immediately after. Um, so correct in disallowing the goal. Now, the interesting thing was that this was a VAR review. The referee missed it, fair enough, too. I don't think many noticed because it was so quick. But the referee didn't go to the screen. Uh, this was a simple VR check, which I found interesting because... Yeah, that's, that surprises me. Um, yeah. Uh, we, on A-League, we definitely have a um, VAR. You'd go to the over far for that, 100%. Even if it's just to sell it. Yeah. To be fair, to be fair um, I watched it live and... I think Karazov came across really well. I mean, this was a black and white thing. Uh, there was no much, uh, no much interpretation. Um, yeah. So that was um, a subjective decision. Though. I mean, they got it right, so it doesn't really matter. We're clutching at straws here. But I think it, uh, it's not subjective in uh, in goal scoring, right? Because it, but the yeah. law, the law basically states if there, if the even if it's accidental, if it's a handball that yeah, leads true. to the goal, then so this to me. Is one of those, and I think it it's a good example of how UEFA have kind of started to optimize the VAR process a little bit more. You know, it, it's taking everyone, at least from the fans and the pundits um, that I've been listening to and, and hearing about or hearing from, are saying that VAR in this tournament is exactly how it should be. Um, and excited, excited, and hoping that. Um, a similar kind of VAR performance will come in in the Premier League. Um, so if it, everyone accepts that, Hassan, like you're saying, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Like then, yeah. that's absolutely the right thing to do, without question. If everyone yeah. turns around, if all the non-refereeing people turn yeah. around after this and go, "Oh yeah, just doing it like that was the right thing," then yeah. I, I, from that, from what I've seen, I think there's a couple, and we'll probably talk about them today, that have been uh, a little bit more contentious which probably are more the ones that are very subjective calls still but we'll we'll get onto them later i'm sure 
Yeah, yeah. This I, I, I think you guys covered it all really well. I mean, it was a very it, it, obvious that it was immediately after the handball, um, so probably that's why there was no review because it wasn't really subjective. It was handball, then then shot on goal. If it was handball, then something else. Yeah. Yes, I, I did find it weird mm. because we we are used to the zone field reviews. Um, yeah. But I think this is probably a good thing moving forward. If it's that obvious that it's handball, then shot. Well, that's immediate. It it becomes a factual thing. That would be so much easier even for everyone to understand. That's what immediate is. It's not immediate or you touch it with your hands and and then move on and something else happens. I think and we I have an example of, of that, something like that later on. Ale, on this one, if Chiellini's done this and the ball drops to his teammate who scores, is that now a goal, right? No, there would still be um, immediate nature, right? It's still yeah. okay. Yeah, so it's still the immediateness. If, if say for example, Chiellini got the ball, but then put put it out of the box, out of the penalty area, and someone took a shot from there, that wouldn't have been immediate because something else has happened. So yeah. the ball has been played three, four, five seconds have gone past, which means oh. well, the handball wasn't the 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 reason why the shot was taken which means yeah. there was something else happening. And this was, obviously, it's quite natural because he's been crammed in between two players. Um, mm -hmm. So it's normally, I wouldn't expect this to be called a handball save if he was defending. Um, so in that situation, that's where the immediateness, it's not there anymore. Cool. Um, and this was it for the Italy's game. It was, other than that, another 3-0. Uh, happy days for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Good, um, uh, good game. Uh, so just to uh, for sum up on, on Italy, um, Karazev uh, was not one of the shiniest referee um, coming into the Euro, uh, but but I think it, it was a bit, mm. you know, for some people, his inclusion in, in, on the roster was a bit of a surprise. Um, but I think he did well. He deserved the call, and and he earned. Uh, he probably earned a second game as well. So he did. Uh, okay, it was not the most challenging game. Uh, but we've finally seen the Karazev that we were used to because he had a bit of a downturn a little bit, but now he's up there again. So fair play to him and to Russia. Yeah, he did the job, which is what basically every referee sort of done in this tournament so far, which, you know, it's the minimum you want to ask at this level. Mm -hmm. Danny Makali, second game for the Dutchman, Finland, Russia, was a quite interesting game. Um, so we go straight away. First, this was a disallowed goal by VAR. The assistant allowed this goal initially, and uh, and then obviously yeah, you can tired. see, you can see it's it, it's literally like a horse race. It's by head. Yeah. <laughs> you need the thought. Yeah, it's literally a, a, a head. So it's really um, really hard on the assistant. Good decision by VAR. Game was disallowed. This was very early on in the game. Uh, there was, I believe, in my opinion, a missed yellow card for this um, challenge. You can see this is studs on foot. Um, it's uh, not even foot, it's on the ankle. So it's it's not great, uh, the contact. Uh, I guess if it's early on in the game, we've seen some of this sort of been let go a little bit more, but because of the nature of the point of contact, which is past the foot, I don't know if you guys agree or disagree with that, but in my opinion, yeah. this should have been given a yellow card. Yeah, definitely. Um, like we've talked about that leniency, but this is above that level of leniency. I, I would say. As a yeah. still, I, I can't remember what, uh, seeing this particular incident, uh, but as a still, it definitely looks like yellow. And it looks very, I think we talked about this a lot in match day one. Very, I think there was three or four ex almost identical to this, right? That were consistent yeah. in yellow. So, yeah. I think, yeah, so uh, actually, so funnily enough, later on, the same Kamara, he, here is the player that gets fouled, and he makes the foul here, which is basically the same challenge, uh, a bit more lunging, and this resulted in a yellow card in the 21st yeah. minute. So this episode was, I think, five, six minutes before, and this was not even given as a foul, so probably the refereeing team just missed it uh, altogether. Yeah. yeah. Whilst this resulted in a yellow card, which I think is the correct decision. Um, interestingly enough, Kamara was involved in a lot of these challenging throughout the game, so was probably a little bit nervous. Um, now, this was interesting. Uh, there was a big kick 
on the face, but very unlucky. The the red player, the Russian player, hits hit the post in this situation. His leg bounced back uh, and hit the face of the Finland player. Um, obviously, nothing came of it. It was just unlucky. Just it was interesting to point out because I know on Refcoach in the group we see quite a lot sometimes player. Um, some members think that players have control of their body in this situation. Just to remark, this is just bad luck. Uh, if it happens, let's let's understand poor players sometimes can't do much about their body. Um, and then this was the last incident of the game. Um, there was no yellow card. There was a yellow, there was no yellow card here. I thought this could have probably been for management. The game got a bit snappy towards the end. There was a lot of little fouls and a lot of um, nervousness, again, because there's something at stake now. So players were really going for it. And it's interesting how this was probably a high careless, more, than, more so than a reckless, but it's right in front of the bench of the technical areas. And you can see here the Russian, um, the Russian coach that uh, with his arms up remonstrating. So this is a bit of coaching, as we always call the, the area in front of the technical areas, the third penalty area, because of the presence of the technical areas and the team officials. So always interesting, always interesting to think that maybe we we raised the bar a little bit for those incidents, especially in a tough game. Um, another good game overall for Makali. Um, so we can move on to Fernando Rapalini, the, the South American, which did really well in his first game. Um, he had the first on-field review of the tournament. So I wonder how he played on him being, uh, being the, the guy from, uh, from South America, the Euros, and uh, getting an on-field review, <laughs> the first of the tournament. Um, he did well despite that. Um, as we will see in a minute, it was really hard to um, to pick as a, as a foul, as an offense. Um, this was a first goal disallowed correctly by the by the assistant for an offside from Pandem, um, which then finished beautifully. The goal unfortunately didn't stand. As we can see from the screenshot, we don't even need to be our lines, it's fairly obvious that it's offside. Um, the, so the, the, the assistant delayed, I presume. Yes. Did he give it? Yeah. Yeah. Delayed. Can I, scored, flag went up. Can I? Can I say that the assist? Uh, we we said the referees were excellent throughout the tournament, but the assistants have been super excellent. Yeah. So far, they've been outstanding. Some great decisions, especially by the English teams this morning. They were fantastic. Mm -hmm. Gary Beswick, um, especially. Yeah. Yep. Uh, this was the first simulation of the tournament, um, which have, and I found amazing the body language of the of the of Rapalini because um, we can see he was in a great position to see it. Jack, as it was seen before, he was a little bit more behind in this situation, a bit more to the left of play, um, which allowed him to see. As you can see, there's no contact whatsoever. Um, number ten you, from Ukraine just goes down, and it's great to see him, Rapalini, the referee, going up, up afterwards, giving the yellow card. Um, it was just obvious everyone accepted it. There was no dissent whatsoever. Even number 10 afterwards, if you watch the game, it was giggling. It sort of puts his head down. It goes, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I this, think being, yeah. a, being a South American referee really trains you well on simulation. So, <laughs> uh, so that uh, <laughs> but he, he was, he was, he was, he he was excellent, and and I think it was a sweet spot for him in a very good game. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, so this this to me was the decision of the round of the match yeah. day. I think personally, yeah, interesting because I've read very um, contrasting decisions. Uh, we can see Rapalini, the, the the referee in the background. This was not the on field review, and this was given a penalty. So. Um, Pandev is attacking, and we can see the defender chase, challenge for the ball. What do you guys think? Yeah, I thought I, I initially didn't think it was a penalty, um, but then when you watched it back, you see Pandev quickly and really smartly kind of understand almost what would happen. He quickly tried to get the ball, and he did, and 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 then there was contact from the the. Um, the opposition. So actually, I thought it was a great spot uh, from the referee. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, it was great to see. I wonder if the assistant gave 
gave uh, Rapalini something because, as we can see in the screenshot, it's quite far and probably can't see. But the decision came quite quickly. So, yeah, as Hassan, as you said, Pandev kicks the ball first and then the Ukrainian player comes on and kicks the back of his uh, the back of his heel. So it, was, so quick. it was a penalty. Yeah. It's so quick, the, the time between those two little kind of pieces of contact. The, yeah, uh, you've got to think that the assistant referee has given him a, a clear penalty or pen 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 in the in the um in the uh, audio yeah and this finally we get to the on field review which happened uh, fairly late in the game uh there was a free kick from the side um and a player from the macedonian wall went up with his arm outstretched uh we can see the assistant referee almost on the advertisement banners um probably couldn't see it because he was focusing on the offside line down here. Uh, Rappellini would have had his, his view obstructed by the players. Um, so play went on for a set, for a cup for a few seconds. Um, and then they are called Rappellini for an on-field review, which was quick to make a decision really, because he saw it as I kept, he watched the replay a couple of times. Um, and this was a shot on goal as well. Um, when you see the video, you can see the player was actually attempting to shoot. Um, and that's, I think, what Rapalini was reviewing. It was interesting if you can go and watch the review because he looks at the handball first and he goes, yeah, definitely. And then you can see the VAR goes really back and forward and picks a couple of angles that look at where the ball was kind of going. Um, and he picks the yellow card for stopping a promising attack, stopping a shot on goal, which I thought was quite interesting. Yeah, well, I mean, without seeing it, seeing it live, um, you'd be, I'd be surprised if a player shooting from there. But you yeah, know, you obviously took the time to think about it, and there you go. Yeah, it, it was it's, it's unusual. On the tricky side, seeing this live, you know, if this is on the left hand side, well, then the fourth official can come down and help. But obviously, being on that side, you without the fourthy there, you, you're. Um, you're really yeah. left a bit high and dry. You have to think about focus areas. And when they've got VAR, you as the ref, you will want to be more focused on that group of players because VAR can fix it if this exact incident happened, yeah. which I did in this situation. All right. Next up. Cool. Next up. Austria. Netherlands on Austria. The Israeli Aurel Grimfeld. Um, he had an okay game. Um Again, we had a lot of very choppy games, uh, very physical again. I think the physicality is in some games that kicked up a notch, especially when there's teams that are playing, uh, maybe have lost or drew, uh, like, like we were saying before. So um, I think Greenfield did okay. Uh, this was the, we had the second on field review of the game. I don't know if you guys saw the video, what happened, but. Um, there was a couple of interesting things. So we can see the first thing to point out is up here, this um, screenshot shows how the Vry, this was number six for Netherlands. Um, he comes into the penalty area first and he goes down. So these two screenshots, that's what happens. And he kind of goes down really easily. Uh, again, there was something. He then gets up, right? I think he realizes yeah. that, you know, that. that I don't know if he if he goes down easily, expecting or trying to get get a penalty, or if he just slips. Really, you know, and yeah, then up and tries to tries to go for the ball. Correct. So there was some discussion about well, there was a potential simulation before. To me, as these screenshots shows, he tries to get up straight away. Mm -hmm. He doesn't appeal for a penalty, so he probably just slip, like you said, Hassan. So good decision to let play go, and then there is this challenge on number twenty two. Um, we can see number eight from Austria. It's a stomp on the foot. Um, the referee, now we can see from, this is when it happened. And this is some coaching, I thought. You know, you can see Greenfield. He, this came after a bit of a back and forth of the ball. So Austria just lost the ball here. So he was probably expecting the ball to go the other way. And he, was, he had his body turned. So he had his head turned. He couldn't really see well. Um, and he completely missed the incident. His assistant maybe missed it, maybe so, but it would have been further down the field. Um, so, you know, maybe if Greenfield had his body a little bit more open facing the incident, 
would have had a better idea of what's, what was happening, uh, sidestepping a bit. Because the foul, when you see it live, it, there's no way he had his view obstructed. It was quite obvious when you saw it. Uh, and that's where VAR came in and goes, well, probably Greenfield said, no, nah, there was nothing in there. And VAR got, no, nah, that's a clear and obvious mistake. You totally missed it. Go and see it. He saw it, saw the, saw the, saw the foul, saw the yellow card because it's a reckless tackle. It's a stomp on the foot and gave the penalty correctly. Um, these, these were the two most the interesting incidents of this game. Uh, all in all, not a, the best performance of the tournament, but still not a bad performance. Denmark, Belgium, an old friend of, of uh, European football and world football, Bjorn Kuypers. Uh, in this game, I think he did well, as always, as he always, as he's used us to, to do, really. There was a lot of dissent. Um, we can see from these screenshots, uh, you know, first there's uh, number number nine from Denmark here to actually get pulled back by his uh, his teammates because he was going to Kai because he was getting a bit crowded. Uh, Lukaku as well, which is not the kind of player that usually descends, but he had a massive go at the assistant for a corner, which is not a big decision, obviously. Um, and then we can see Toby Aldevira there again screaming at the same assistant, which it didn't look right. And this happened a few times, and I think, again, was another fairly high hit game. I think the referee team could have maybe tackled this a little bit earlier, uh, especially in that 42nd minute with number nine getting really aggressive. That would have looked great if there was a yellow card there. Um, and I think this was because there was a lot of challenges. Kaibers managed his discipline his, his actions really well, his sanctions really well, and fouls really well, I thought. Um, but potentially when things were getting a bit heated, maybe slowing down the game a little bit more and using that yellow card earlier could have helped. Could have, could have, should have, would have. Um, but in this situation, I just think when you see Aldevira screaming and Lukaku screaming and an assistant like that or we're playing being held back, it never looks good. Um, never looks good for referees. Um, this was probably the, the only... Um, incident really that was not straightforward well or was straightforward it was well spotted perfect position by kuipers oh, another simulation <laughs> yeah and another simulation so as we can see there's no contact whatsoever there's like 20 30 centimeters between legs uh kuipers but there is look they it just it was fun it was quite funny how he gave the card he goes there's nothing there like just move on and and everyone accepted it a little note, because we always talk about referees being human. In the 10 minute, uh, Denmark and Belgium, uh, they stopped to clap for Ericsson. Uh, and you could see the referees did as well, which is great because we always talk about referees being humans. And we talked about how Anthony Taylor and his team would have been affected during the game when Ericsson had the heart attack. Um, so it was great to see that the refereeing team joined in and everyone actually commended that uh, and was part of this part of the community for once, which is great to see. I think this, I really love to, to see these things. Be great. Really. And I, I think it was a, a pretty big game for the fact that this was the first game after the incident. So yeah. the, the, the fact that they put uh, Bjorn Kuypers on the game just showed that they wanted someone with, who, who could deal with a lot of, you know, stress and emotion that could have, yeah. could have happened during the game. So. Hundred <clears throat> percent, and he did, he did well. He did well as as expected. So. We lost a son. I'm oh, sure he'll okay. come back. <laughs> <laughs> he disappeared suddenly. He'll come back. Technical issues. There he is. Well, let's start talking about the England game before he gets yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> England, Scotland. Nice to have you back, Hassan. <laughs> um, Antonio must be allowed. Can, I, can we just skip this game? Because it was so boring, you know. That, uh, it was like, like the most boring game in, in recent history. Did I you, fell asleep. Did you I actually? Fell asleep. Boring. I watched it. I, I, sle I fell asleep on the sofa. That's so interesting because I found it, <laughs> I found it interesting, and 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 it was all because of Scotland. Um, I thought they played really well, and I thought they had a lot. Uh, uh, they as a, I think they're th the third lowest ranked team in the tournament. 
Uh, and I thought they they looked better than us on the day. Um, uh, but I will say that Leos was um, widely applauded by at least fans that I've seen in England um, who just thought it was a good good refereeing performance. Not much to do, not much to do, yeah. Ruth, but um, but uh, I think people are really like to see his personality. Uh, yeah. So. No, to be yeah. fair, uh, Lao Tzu did, did well once again. Um, mm. It's really, this season has been incredible. As yeah. I said, it was a very sloppy game. Yeah. I mean, it was terrible, but... Uh, uh, you know, uh, to be fair, uh, fair play to him because uh, probably if I refereed this game, I would have fallen asleep on the field, but it didn't. <laughs> so fair, fair play to him. <laughs> uh, and as he, it, it's funny that you mentioned Asani's personality because this was, I found, really good. Um, this was a yellow card for the Sint, and you can see when he gives the yellow card, he looks at the, the Scottish player and goes, No more. He puts his finger to the mouth and goes, No more. So we talked a lot about body language and how in this tournament everyone has been really doing it a lot, very big and played of body language. And this was great because everyone <laughs> straight away, even the commentators got, oh, he must have said something. Yeah. Because mm. there was a bit of, of what's happening here. And he goes, no more. Um, Pointings and you, that was you. You said it's a great body language, a yellow card. Very well done again. It's very theatrical, but it's, it's effective. So. Yeah. Yeah, true. Now, this was something that, um, well, what do you, what do you, what do you think, Hassan? <laughs> as think. No, as a fan, I wanted it, but I don't think it's a penalty. No, I, it, I, was a, it was very soft. It, it, if he would have given it, everyone would have said, oh, that's a soft penalty, exactly. It's, it's, it, it didn't deserve to be given, I don't think, even though, even though I wanted it to, <laughs> you know. As a, as a fan, you always want it. It's there. I totally feel you. Yeah. And this is where I think it, in terms of VAR, um, I think, I think, I'm speculating, but in the Premier League, this may have been given. Whereas in Europe, I, I feel like they've, I feel for this whole tournament, they've raised the threshold, the barrier to kind of intervention a lot higher than in any of the domestic leagues, which I think is a good thing. Because yeah. I, I think maybe if this was a domestic league, you you, you might see this uh, reviewed. I don't I don't know. I don't know if um, Jack you would agree, but uh, possibly possibly in Europe in a domestic league. Yeah, it would all, for us, it would all depend on the information that the referee's given. Yeah, yeah. If the refs yeah. clearly seen it and just said, "Yeah, there's contact, but not enough contact for pen," then I, I don't think we are they able to touch it. But if the refs um, if the ref said, "Oh, I think you," the, the ref said the only contact is with the arm. Well, then obviously yeah. the ref missed some. It's a different story. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think in you know in this situation, uh, as you said, Asan, like as a fan, you want it, but when you look at it, there's a little a little scrape on the foot. But the real thing that made Sterling sort of fall a bit, he let himself go a lot, and you can <laughs> see in the second screenshot, he like it hits himself that the back of the foot of the other player. He was looking for it a bit. Uh, being an, an attacker, as they always, as they all do, doesn't matter and, where which nation you're from. <laughs> yeah, and I and I think that didn't help, right? Because if if it was just the trip, then I think there may be an opportunity that VAR comes in. But the fact that then the trip, and then there's a contact between his own leg and his both of his legs, then yeah, it doesn't, it didn't, didn't look great. So uh, if, I, yeah. if I can say something on on Lord's. Uh, which is uh, connected to this episode too, but uh, but it's more of a general remark. He started the game uh, refereeing very much the Spanish way, uh, whistling every little contact and foul, maybe because he wanted to set his footprint on, on the game. Yeah. But then, yeah. know, knowing it was England and Scotland that are used to playing a very different football, um, as the game went on, he changed his approach and he became much more lenient, much more prone to let them play and i think this was one of the of, of those situations where uh, probably that's what Hassan was trying to say that maybe in spain you would probably consider giving this uh but given that it was england and scotland you don't really it's it's very soft you know yeah uh, so that that's a possibility by the way i just got a comment by somebody asking me if jack is in uh antarctica at the moment because he's got a woolly hat <laughs> and a warm tea drink, drinking a warm tea 
Well, to be fair, Danielle, it's when we started, it was 7 a.m. and it was uh, three degrees here in Melbourne, so not far off. I thought Australia's going to be sunny all year round. What yeah, is... maybe up in uh, North Queensland. Yeah, not, not, not want, in do, Melbourne. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to swap with my 35? <laughs> well, no, like, so we do have, like, oh, I'm going out on the bike this morning and I'll have long sleeve jersey, gloves. It'll be cold. Mm. It gets frosty. Wow. Um, all right. Um, Croatia, Czech Republic, the, the Sierra Grande, um, he didn't have his best performance, if we want to put it this way. There was a few situations where it could have been better. Um, lots of fouls, a lot of decisions that could have been one way or the other. And we start from another wrong field review, uh, the third of the tournament. And we can see how... Uh, this was off a corner, I'm pretty sure, or, or across from the side. Um, the number six from Croatia just gets up. Why These arms. are so hard. When both players yeah. had their arms up, these are so hard. Yeah, very hard to see. When players got their arms up, it's easy. But when both had their arms up, like there's centimetres between the two players. Yeah. Yeah. So good good to call the on-field review. It took a while to be able to decide whether to call the referee or not. So there might have been some discussion about what did you see, what did you not see. Um, finally, the Cerro Grande was called to the VAR. Uh, both it did the review correctly, gave the penalty and the yellow card. Um, so that was their correct outcome. Interesting. Maybe this has been... A Can bit I, before we move yeah. on, though... Yeah. Do you do you all think this was a penalty? Because this got um, oh, you're a, right. yeah. a lot of questions, uh, especially by m mainly a lot of the pundits in, in England that just didn't think it was a penalty at all. Um, so I'm, I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts because I have my own thoughts. So in my opinion yeah it should be a penalty uh re usually really when we think about you know legal use of arms you need to see the movement of the arm in this situation number six went like this the contact was elbow not elbow on face um as we'll see in the next slide this was blood um so it was it was a reckless challenge as well yes they are, have players have the right to challenge and jump but look at his arms why are you jumping like this? Are you jumping at a rave or are you jumping in a football bench? Yeah. No, so, I, I, I yeah. personally think it was a, a penalty too. Um, there's just elements of who initiated the contact. Was it the attacker who actually headed the arm versus the defender actually placing the, the arm on the attacker? So that's one of the things. The only other thing that when, when I was watching it back was just – looking if there was potential violent conduct, actually. Um, mm. For me, the key kind of tool, uh, not the, the key kind of uh, indicator is if the, the fist of Lovren is clenched yeah. or not clenched, right? If it's clenched, you can say, okay, well, he's meant to try and elbow him. If it's open, it's he's trying to use his arms as a tool. So therefore, yellow for me was correct. But yeah. I'm intrigued by the next piece because I saw this in a... Um, uh, I think it's a really interesting uh, one to talk about. Yeah. So this is the one. So the Czech player came back and took the penalty with blood on his shirt um, and blood on really under his nose, even though after Grande sort of checked him. Uh, look, this is interesting because I think everyone knows and everyone's told if there's blood on a shirt, you can't. You need. You need to change. You need to change the the t-shirt. You know. You need to change your top. Your your, your um, shorts. Wherever, whatever, wherever, whatever has got blood on. He was allowed to take the penalty. Quite interesting, I think, because if he was a penalty taker, um, you know, in theory, by law, we should make sure that there's no blood, really. Um, and, you know, yeah. this is a really hard one. I, I thought about this, how to manage this, right? Yeah. I think recently, a couple of years ago, IFAB put in the laws that if a player's injured, uh, but he's going to be the penalty kick taker, that he can receive yeah. treatment and still take the penalty. So this is a really interesting one because the guy's nose was actively bleeding while he was about to take the penalty. So it's kind of like, okay, well, that law says, well, the player can, can get treatment and then take the penalty. But then... It, how long do you wait? 
you can't wait 10 minutes for him to get treatment and for the blood to stop, right? So it's a really difficult one here because it's a, not a penalty and it's isolated. I think, cool, we can let him go. But but then he's got to get straight off the field. The problem yeah. you have is he's about to score a goal and he's about to celebrate with all his mates and all of this blood's going to go everywhere. And probably what happened is four people have come out of that celebration with blood on their shirts. So yeah. it's just, a, I, I don't think there's a, a winning scenario here because if the referee said, hey, actually, because you're bleeding, you can't take this penalty, that's going to cause even more of an uproar than a little bit of blood on the shirt. Especially my... especially if the replacement penalty taker misses the penalty. Exactly. So yeah. I, I think this is, you know, one of those where kind of law almost contradicts it or doesn't help you here um, because it kind of wants you to do one one of one thing or the other yeah one thing or the other um, but in terms of managing the event as the referee I think this was the right outcome what he did what he allowed to happen Jack yeah, I do agree I'm, I'm intrigued <laughs> it's tricky I've never had it personally and I've never seen the situation otherwise um, yeah, it's really hard uh, I think you lose in both situations because, like yeah. you said, you make him get changed. You send him if, if the nose should stop bleeding at this point, right? It's easy. You just change your jersey, come back on, take the penalty. Cool, happy days. Because obviously it was still going. I, I think I think it's in a rock and hard place. I think it's what's going to leave the biggest sour taste in in the fans' mouth and the 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 event. Right? Think of the match as an event and. If you tell this player he can't take a penalty because he's just been injured and he's got blood, you, you know, I think yeah. that yeah, elevates yeah. you to being, um, you know, over the top in, you know, and not empathetic, right? So I don't know. It's a really difficult, challenging one. So, yeah, yeah. So overall, there was not much talking about it. Um, so. You know, it's a refereeing sort of nitpicking. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, this was another bit. I think that's where management, more management, could have been done. This happened, um, I think, was towards the end of the of the first half, and we can see Versalico. He really gets into his opponent. The ball's gone. It's a late challenge. There was no violence, but it was. It could have been punished with a foul, first of all, and the yellow card. Um, play was let go and this is just an example of how things were sort of going during the game and that didn't aid the Saragandas control um, and this was another interesting bit the game finished 20 seconds earlier there was three Are minutes sure that's not a clock error <laughs> no I checked I've gone and checked all over the world and it's been everyone has gone the game finished 20 seconds earlier um, which was interesting because that's my that was my thought of like maybe the, the streaming from the Euros was different, so maybe that's what happened. Uh, maybe his watch started early, or we don't know, but obviously it's always hard because with spectators and fans, you look 20 seconds early and you go, Damn, it looks like maybe we played LA, less than where we should. It was like maybe it was just like my game the other week where his watch didn't start. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it could be anything, literally. So, again, it was a 1-1, 20 seconds. If you didn't score a second goal in, in, in 90 minutes, you're not going to score already. Yeah, Cro Croatia, Croatia were attacking when he was scoring. Yeah. 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 Um, and that was it. So, it was interesting I, to see that happening. If I, can, if I can say something about Del Cerro, um, we have two Spanish referees at, the, at these Europe's, Laos and Del Cerro. They couldn't be uh, more different, you know. You have Laos, uh, where is very much into body language, man management. Then you have uh, Del Cerro, who is very much more of a classical Spanish referee. He's, he's got an amazing fitness. Um, he's very quick, always near the action, but he's lacking a bit on the management side, you know. Yeah, uh, he's so more authoritative. Um, yeah, I mean, his fitness is fantastic. I mean, he, he's very good looking, looks like a Hollywood actor, he's very fast, very quick. Uh, but, but, he's, uh, but, but he's not loud when it comes to managing the players in the game. Yeah, um, he did struggle so, a bit, especially in this game. 
so they're two very good referees of course uh, but they're very very different yeah. yeah i mean a bit like uh oliver and taylor if you want you know oliver as we were saying before is much more of an english style referee taylor is more of a european style i mean it's interesting how the same country can develop two referees that are so different in their styles you know yeah it's very interesting anyway that that's all i want to say about <laughs> the cerro <laughs> and well, so now we can move on to one of the surprises of the tournament, as you mentioned before, Daniele, Daniel Siebert. He's done really well in this game. Um, not an easy game. Um, it, must be the it, must be the, it must be the name. <laughs> um, <laughs> but some really good decisions, all in all, very well managed. Uh, good spot here on this penalty. Um, we can see the way uh, he was positioned. He had a fair good view, maybe uh, aided by the assistant because of this player. And blocking potentially his view. Uh, this was the dog zone because next thing that was going to happen, the yellow attacker, the Sweden attacker, the Swedish attacker, he was going to get the ball and take a shot on an empty goal. Um, challenge for the ball, as we can see from these screenshots, challenge for the ball, goalkeeper tries to save the ball, gets the player, yellow card, dog zone, penalty kick. Correct decision, spot on. No one complained about it. Uh, I love this bit, this screenshot to me, this yellow card indirect free kick for descent. I am so glad he did it. Wow. You can see number number eight from Slovakia just screaming at him and going mad. And Sibir stops the game, gives him a yellow card and indirect free kick. If that doesn't help management, nothing else will. You know, in the middle of the park, there was no promising attack going on or anything. So it was a good moment to stop the match, gave it showed so much authority the player if you see the video he turns around stop and richly it's it's so blatant and obvious screams at him and gets so angry and like there's no need for that booked him that's it that was the last time you heard of him of him <laughs> which was great it worked um do, you don't see this often do you so it's very brave but it's fantastic yeah yeah because i mentioned before there was a lot of crowding in this match day too there wasn't in this game so that shows that this kind of stuff works. Mm. Um, this was a potential handball. Some some of the players sort of expected a penalty here, but what happened was this is in the first screen we can see how close the players were. The player here on the left in this bottom right screen kicks the ball away that then hits the arm when it's here, kind of close to the body, very natural movement. It was kicked by a player that was near. Um, so this was never a handball nor a penalty uh, because it was, was an unexpected ball, natural position of the arm, not making his body bigger, not taking a risk. Uh, I thought that was the right decision. Sieber had a perfect view on it. Another great decision that resulted in a no penalty. Um, so really good performance from him. Um, Probably we're gonna see him see him again, maybe in a knockout round, which would be very good. Before you guys start on Anthony Taylor, I'm gonna tap out. So enjoy the rest of the uh, review, and I'll see you for match day three. Thank you, Jack. Have a lovely day. All right, Anthony Taylor. Now, Hassan, you must be proud because both Englishmen, both English teams, did really well. Uh, Portugal, Germany. What a game it was. Uh, very good game. game aided by the officials because I think they had yeah. a few yeah. big uh decisions, especially uh, uh, quite a lot of offside decisions that just seemed to be perfect. So, um, yeah. uh, really, really uh, great performance by the team. Just and... a... I agree. Gone, you go. No, no, I was saying, I, I said I agree. Uh, sorry, yeah. I interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and well, Adam Nunn is a great assistant referee. It seemed like everything was in Gary Bezik's area today, and, and he got <laughs> is the one. Um, uh, and yeah, fantastic. And this this is what you need as a referee to get a big game in the future. It's not just yeah. your performance, but your team as a whole. And um, and they obviously benefit from working together all the time in the Premier League and and throughout European competitions. So, yeah. um, big game to get, 
again, probably the biggest one of match day two. I think all of the, the there's there's a big game in this group every match day, um, yeah. and and it was great uh, to see Anthony get this the, this appointment. Um, so yeah, a pretty flawless performance, I thought. But uh, I am biased. Uh, I'd love to hear you guys' opinion on it. Couldn't agree more. I think I think uh, uh, first of all the game was great, uh, yeah. just like just like England's was the worst game of of the Euro. This was the this was the <laughs> best game of the Euros. Uh, very exciting and you know uh, very fast game. And Anthony kept up uh, with with the pace really well. Um, to be fair, uh, I think Anthony made it easy for himself. Uh, he didn't really have to intervene much for the first in the first half second half he had two yellow cards but they were bo both spot on and compulsory yellow cards so he kept uh, he kept his interventions to a minimum and and just yeah. like uh, Hassan said this was maybe uh, the, the showcase of uh, master class assistant refereeing especially yeah um both both assistants were were excellent but Gary um, AA1 Gary Bezik Especially, he had, uh, I believe, six very close calls, and they were all correct and supported by VAR. Uh, when he when he took away the first goal by Germany by literally centimeters, he uh, was he was spot yeah. uh, on. When he gave another goal, he was yeah. spot on. So, yeah, you just check the episodes now. But but uh, uh, you know, Anthony, excellent, but his assistant referees, oh my god, <laughs> you know, yeah. they were incredible. They were incredible. Which, it's interesting, right? Because even when we look at this, if you look at the VAR shot, you can see that he was not perfectly in line. Uh, but I think experience and gut feeling and that knowledge, that's, you know, that's 90% of your decisions, really. Because mm. um, then, Sanch, I keep I keep mixing them up. Is it, it's Nab Nab Nabri, Nabri. Nabri, yeah. Nabri, yeah, this time I remembered. Uh, Nabri challenges for the ball. Um, obviously, and it's very close and has an impact on the keeper. And that's why he then gives the, um, gives the offside here. So great decision. I mean, it's literally, it, again, it's a hit. <laughs> so fantastic decision by, by, uh, by Beswick. Um, there's so many other more, but they were, Probably too many to to go through them all, but this is just an example of how incredible this game was by by the team. Very very enjoyable game. Very enjoyable. Yeah. Um, I thought one of the I think it was mostly about offsides, and you know, Anthony Taylor did really well in his sanctions. There wasn't anything too particular from him. It was everything? Everything was pretty straightforward. He made it straightforward. So, congratulations to him for that. I think this was a good. Um, example of, uh, you know, we talked about the immediate handball on the Chiellini goal before. Uh, this was how the uh, Germany goal um, in, started, as a matter of fact. Uh, one of the Germany goals started. Um, obviously, there was a handball outside the penalty area. This is not a handball either, either way um, because Muller is using the arm to support his body. Uh, but obviously, we knew that if, it was, if there was an immediate goal or promising attack, this would have still been given as a free kick. Well, now, because there was those three, four seconds in, bef in between the handball um, incident and the goal, this is where the meaningness is lost. So I thought it was good to point out the difference between this and, uh, and Chiellini. This is all I had for this game, just because, you know, the offside decisions were great. We've all seen them. Uh, I, I, can, I can only make a comment on, on two situations, which you probably don't have on on the highlights, but uh, yeah. um, if if really we want to to pick something, because as as you said, it was really a uh, really well refereed game. There were two situations where there was a bit of dissent by some players that was a bit over the top. Um, Andre talked to the players, but maybe uh, something stronger could have been warranted because they were. It was really. Uh, Evident uh, the, the, the dissent was was uh, was clear to everybody, you know. So maybe you could you could go a bit tougher on that. The first situation was with Tony Cross, uh, foul foul in the second half, where he literally shouted at at, at uh, Anthony twice, 
uh, and Andrew talking back very co uh, calmly, but maybe maybe uh, something more, as I said, a uh, yellow card or, or uh, even a stronger talk. Um, and there was another situation uh, where Sanchez, I believe it was, um, after uh, a decision by the assistant referee didn't go his way, he kicked the ball towards the assistant referee and hit the publicity banner behind. Yeah, uh, that that maybe could have been a yellow card, you know. Um, but other than that, as you said, uh, the game was excellent by the referees. So it was uh, we're really uh, yeah you know, picking uh, some small things here. So. Yeah, I think it's his calmness was the best thing to see in this game because it was obviously a a fairly important game with high stakes, and he was just so calm all the time. It was just. Yeah, it's just a game. I'm doing my job and moving on with it, which was fantastic because that really helped him. Even with the descent, I think maybe we do expect a little bit more leniency from Premier League referees because there's more, I think, it, the, the communication, it's more stressed uh, than, you know, than a Spanish country, for example, um, than a Spanish referee. But I think overall it was good. That's, it's funny you bring up that kicking the ball because I noticed in all games there's been lots of leniency on that even for delaying the restart of play. Uh, it's happened a few times, but there's been lots of leniency. Um, so I wonder if maybe that's an indication, that's an instruction that came um, for the tournament to let those things go a little bit more, um, unless it's too over the top. So it's quite interesting because it happened in a few in a few games that they could have been, but the referees decided to manage, which personally I like uh, if it's not too much. Obviously, in this situation, maybe it was more than just the line that restarted the game. But one probably was one that should have been given a card. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, because yeah, it was a bit different. But... There may be some form of instruction. And look, when there's the the thing is, you, you get two yellow cards and you miss a game in this tournament, right? And yeah. uh, it's a small tournament, short tournament. So I think that might be something that's been shared amongst the referees from as an instruction who knows i don't know yeah it, it it would feel like that i think because we've seen lots of more management and lots of leniency especially in the early stages of each game just and i think you you know that the reason being we don't want to miss to get players to miss out for silly fouls or silly things that could be managed which i think it's good for the tournament and uh, now michael oliver the other the other englishman um, again, good performance, no problems at all. Uh, interesting game. Um, fantastic body language by him as well. I really like this, which happened again this morning in the in the in the last game of the match day too. You can see this. This wasn't in isolation a yellow card, uh, but you can see by Michael Oliver's language because no, it's the second time you do this. It was persistent infringement. There was a lot of these kind of small fouls that were not just reckless, but kept happening. So went to the players, everyone knew. Everyone knew there was a second foul. The commentator said it. It's like, it's only too many times Oliver's told him, that's it, yellow card. So great body language, great way to um, yeah. to give a yellow card, yeah. Um, this was another situation very similar to what we've seen before um, that Oliver let play. And this is, after this, there was some dissent. Again, a, a, quite a late challenge. Um, we've seen a few of these been missed as fouls altogether. I think this was something that could have been given at least as a foul because uh, the ball, as we can see in the second screen, it's gone. Um, but again, other than this, there was not much um, else. There was in disagreement in the game. Players agreed with, uh, with Oliver. They accepted him, accepted his decisions. Um, this again from a margin perspective because this was not long after the, this first yellow card. That's where it could be more important to sort of slow the things down a little bit and be more strict just to keep control. But he did anyway. He chose very well when to talk and when to give cards. I think this was a disappointment was was a good sign for him because uh, it was a big game. It was a surprising game to some extent. It was yeah. uh, one of the games in a full stadium. Which, which is no easy feat, um, and he did he did well. So I think I think he will uh, most certainly do another game, um, and uh, I, I think if a if if a son doesn't get angry at me if I say that, but I <laughs> I I think the English referees will go further than the English national team. 
<laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Possibly, possibly. If if they keep playing like this, they will, it, it will be the case. Uh, Listen, I'll, I'll, I'll predict. I'll, I'll I'll be bold now. There'll be an English team in the final. I don't. Yeah, I do. No, I do gotta, feel. Yeah, you got you, you've got three teams. So yeah, I, I, uh, I, I think there'll be an English team. In the final. Okay, good. We'll see. I, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, I, it's pretty, it's pretty funny to have an English team in a in a European final, right? Yeah, they, exactly. they, they don't, they, they, they don't seem to like Europe that much. <laughs> <they think. laughs> yeah, I, I do, I do think, I do agree with you, Asan. I have, I think my my one of my favorites rest of the tournament, which is Taylor. I think he's got a really good chance. Yeah. Um, if England doesn't get to the final, which I mean, by the first two games they didn't really give you much hope for that, uh, but. I, I he's refereed really well, so yeah. Spain Poland, the last game of match day two was this morning, uh, Orsato, which we already sort of said to begin with. It wasn't probably the greatest games refereed. Um, a few episodes in this to sort of look at. Um, we talked a lot about this kind of stomping, and it was very early, um, was I think 21st minute. Morata stop, stomps on a Polish player foot. Um, Orsato, as we can see in the screenshot, plays advantage. So he sees the foul, but it doesn't give him a yellow after afterwards. Again, early in the game, these kind of incidents, they have been managed the whole tournament. So in line, to quote you, Hassan, from, from the last time we chatted, all games have felt like they've been refereed by the same referee. Um, so decision in line with the tournament. I wonder if in other other leagues or other competition we may say this as a yellow because that's what it used to be or an automatic yellow. You, but in this situation again managed, and and it was okay. I think it was okay for this situation. Um, as we go on, now this was Spain's goal. Now from this angle, so Morata down here in the middle scores a goal. Um, number nine is crossing. This is when the ball is kicked. Initially, the assistant referee gave this as uh, an offside. Now, the angle here can trick you because it kind of looks like Morata is a little bit further. But when you look at the VAR lines, you can see how there is a foot of the defender that is keeping Morata onside. So after VAR review, um, the goal was correctly awarded. So, good. This was a really, really yeah. tight. A hard decision to give. So on the hard. Field. I don't <laughs> yeah. think there's any criticism aimed at the assistant. No, in way. no there's there there shouldn't be any any criticism. If if I can only um, uh, make a point on this, um, it's very minor, but it, it would be interesting to know what uh, instructions are given to the assistant referees in cases like this. Like, um, because the the AR went up with the flag, right? Um, yeah. then VAR overturned it and that's fine but uh, at, at least uh, in other uh, leagues I'm not sure about the Euros they give instructions to stay down as much as possible let the goal be scored and after do the check while in the, in this situation the, the, the assistant referee opted to, 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 to raise the flag so um, it, it's that's interesting just, no because yeah. my understanding is mm -hmm. and and pretty consistently, my understanding is you allow the goal to be scored and then make your and then if it's, if you were going to give an offside, raise your flag then, right? So this to me was pretty consistent with him thinking it was offside and wait, waiting for that progression of the, the attack to happen. So this would be fairly consistent in England from what I've seen and Champions League, etc. So. He 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 made a decision. He thought it was offside. It was so close. And yeah. This is the example. Everyone gets up in arms about VAR, VAR, VAR. This is the perfect example of why VAR is yeah, there. is needed. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think, as you said before, in this tournament, VAR has been used the way it should be used. Yeah. And this, if you want to, if anyone thinks VAR shouldn't be there, they should just watch this tournament, and they would change their mind. <laughs> Yeah, and look, it's just people getting used to new 
processes, new technologies, and no one knew what the right involvement of VAR should be. And it has to come over time. It has to be refined, and it's slowly getting there, I think. And and this is uh, this is the culmination of many European leagues been using VAR for the last couple of years now. And we're really getting to a, a, a very good point in VAR world. Yeah, which is, a, is, a, is everything. It takes time to get there. Another example here, uh, very similar to um, Oliver just before. So we mentioned this incident again, Orsato, as you can see that foul, it's not really reckless. It's not stopping a promising attack, but Orsato tells uh, the Polish player, second time you've done it. That is so interesting because I saw the foul and I thought the yellow card was harsh and I didn't see this uh, gesture. So now yeah. you've shown me that, it makes a load of sense. Uh, yeah. It was really interesting. Yeah, it, exactly. Exactly same as I did when I saw it. I was like, oh, no, that's... But then you, when Osato goes and does that, same as Oliver. Again, very exactly the same gesture by in two different officials in two different games, which is great because it gives that consistency. Um, then there was this. Um, there was this was the Lewandowski goal. There was absolutely nothing. This reminded me, funnily enough, again another game refereed by Orsato in the Champions League, Man City versus Real Madrid. The Spanish teams ask the Spanish team asked for a push for a foul. There was absolutely nothing. It's a bare touch. If this is a foul, we we wouldn't be playing football. Mm -hmm. um, so again, great decision by the officials. We are correctly did not get involved. Um, goal scored, 1-1, one, one, happy days. Now, this was the fourth and final on-field review of the game. Um, so number nine is attacking, and we can see the Polish player stomping on his foot. Uh, again, towards the end of the game, we saw at the beginning the foul Morata did, kind of similar. There wasn't a yellow card. This ended up being a yellow card uh, for a reckless tackle, not a promising attack. Um, Orsato missed it initially, got called correctly by the on-field review, and uh, by VR to do an on-field review. And from this screenshot, we can see why he missed it. Uh, from his positioning, he had his view completely blocked by two defenders. Um, the assistant was probably focused on Morata on the other side of the penalty area and three players in the middle could have not seen it. Um, so VR probably just asked, what do you see? Orsato said, nothing. <laughs> Because he couldn't have, have physically seen nothing, because he had two players in in between. Uh, do you think? Do you think the assistant referee could have seen this? No, I person personally, and this is again just speculation, but I think he was looking at Morata on the other side because the cross was happening. So he, all he had to focus on was the ball being kicked and the player in an offside position and the second last defender. Uh, so he would have completely ignored any any challenge, um, which is fair, which is what you should be doing. So. But also with the referee that close, you wouldn't expect him to pay that much attention. Um, so I think all in all was correct, the VAR decision would have been nicer, as Jack said at the beginning of this session. If Osado was a little bit wider, maybe he would have seen it, um, trying to avoid that obstruction of his view. Um, so I don't know if you guys saw it live uh, and what you think of it, but I thought it was the right decision at the end, penalty in yellow. Yeah, I agree. It's the right decision. Uh, um, yeah. Um, I just hope that that uh, the fact that Orsato didn't see it will not count against him. Uh, but as you said, it was very very difficult. But you know, yeah. there, there were uh, there were two. It was the first game in the Euros where there were two um, checks, VAR checks. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's never nice for the referee to see two decisions overturned, of course. Um, but but as you said, it, it was it was really difficult to see. So I, I don't think this will count against them. Yeah, correct. And the last example, the last um, incident of this game again, because we talked about crowding quite a lot. Um, this was a bit of a spa, uh, as we can see from the bottom right screenshot. The Spanish player just gets stripped. Uh, or Sarri is quick to give the yellow card, and then straight away he gets crowded by lots of Polish players, used his, uh, his authority to, to try and get him out. It wasn't the nicest scene. Uh, there was a lot of 
pressure put on him. It's happened a few, a, a lot more in the second round. We'll probably see more of these in match day three in the key matches, and it's going to be a lot um, of key matches. So it'll be interesting to see how this gets dealt with. Because um, you can see after the yellow card, it, there's no one around in this area, and all of a sudden there's four players coming around. There's even more coming afterwards. Um, all in all, not the most convincing. It didn't make the, the team didn't make any big bad decisions, but there was a few things that could have probably been done a little bit better. There was one situation that was uh, interesting uh, towards the end, uh, where AR1 went up with his flag, um, I, I presume for an offside, and Orsato played on. And now nothing, nothing major. But I was wondering uh, uh, why not talk to the referee first. I mean. It's never nice to see the AR go up uh, and then you put him down, you overrule him. Uh, you know, it's not nice in a, in a Sunday league game, imagine in a Europe, you know. I actually and, uh, so could, yeah. could, couldn't you just, I mean, I'm just thinking, could you just say, uh, hey, Daniele, this is, I think it's offside, and you could have said, uh, no, no, stay down, stay down, or something like that, you know. I've actually noticed that happening quite a lot this year. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there, there is also... Uh, a factor of VAR uh, because now with assistants having to wait to see what happens next before they go up, um, you'll see quite often that they're waiting to see if, a, if an action, a promising attack actually starts from there. And then they put their flag up, but then they get waved down because, well, the promising attack is gone, so let's let play go. And I think that's required, that's an instruction because of VAR. If there was no VAR, different situation. Um, I don't remember clearly this incident, but there could have been a case. So I'm just trying to think about what could have been some one of the scenarios in that situation. And, and, there uh, and then there was another situation which we talked about. It was very, uh, very, very small one, um, where where he gave a foul uh, to Poland. I think the defense in the penalty area of, of Poland. So it was a defensive free kick. And when he whistled the foul, he pointed to the his finger to the area, you know, uh, almost almost as if it was a penalty, you know, uh, what, what, but it wasn't. It was a defensive free kick. Uh, maybe it's easier to just whistle and then give the foul the other way, you know, to, just to make it clear. Um, now I, everybody knew it was not a penalty, but, but yeah. it's just a, a little thing, you know. Um, well, I think Orsato is, you know, Orsato is, is that kind of referee that, that is uh, always a uh, uh, good, always a safe pair of hands, as you say. Yeah. Um, and and I think he demonstrated that both tonight and uh, in the England Croatia game. Maybe he's not as shiny as he used to be, uh, but but this must be also because he's had a very long season. Uh, um, he, he was used so much this season in the Serie A and Serie B, you know, and the weather also. I, I do not. Uh, I'm not worried. Uh, I, I know he's an excellent referee, and and you can give him any game, and and he will just manage it. You know, but maybe he was not as shiny as as he was in the past. But you know, yeah, and it can uh, happen. You know, it could have been a bad day. Uh, uh, we know yeah, that that yeah. happens to everyone. Yeah, no, no, the, you can't even say a bad day because he didn't make yeah. any major mistake. So exactly. it was. It was only. I think we are just. You know, the thing with him and with other referees as well is that we are so much used. Uh, to excellence from them, that as uh, as soon as a game is not excellent, but it's just very good, we say, ah, he's not excellent, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that's yeah. that's the thing, you know. We're we're uh, he's spoiled us. That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You know, uh, so we were just being overcritical. I think. Yeah, uh, I've seen on some uh, online forums that there's a lot of. Uh, uh, there is a blog online where where uh, every time more subtle referees that there's there's a lot of uh, um, can I can I say bad word or yes not protect shit talking uh, <laughs> but, but yeah I think it's part of the part of the part of our sport it's it's just being a part of being a referee being uh, being uh, being, uh, being talked bad about <laughs> yeah exactly exactly uh oh, very good so what are any games you guys are looking forward to for match day three there's going to be a few good ones i think definitely um definitely it would be interesting to see the portugal germany france group because uh, uh both the the uh, comeback of germany today um after after a very bad game against france and and uh, a combative um combative uh hungary we've seen in the past few <laughs> games so 
Um, so it would be very interesting to see. Uh, we know that probably the three big teams will go through, but it will be interesting to see who's first, who's second, who's third. And um, and the other uh, uh, the other interesting group will be the um, well, the England group will be interesting, but yeah. to a certain extent to see who's first, who's second, of course. Um, I think the other very interesting group is going to be the this uh, Spain group. Yeah. We all expect we yeah. all expect Spain to come on top, but they're actually in third place after two games. Uh, so they, it's a must-win game against Slovakia, I believe. Uh, yeah, right. But Slovakia, we've seen, is not is not the easiest team to play against. So, and, be... uh, as a match, I'm intrigued by Italy Wales. I think uh, mm-hmm. Italy have obviously looked the best. They've scored the most goals and conceded the least, uh, or joint least, I guess. But um, but uh, I think they haven't been tested, uh, and I think Wales will will be a, an interesting, almost like when we played Scotland, there'll be a, you know, they have that niggly, passionate team that, you know, would be interesting. So uh, I don't think it'll be an easy, an easy win for you guys tomorrow. It's interesting, right? Because I've been thinking, because you read about it and you look at Turkey, for example, they beat France and, and Germany in the qualifiers. And then... You have Switzerland, the number 13 in the world, and they were a relatively easy game. Now, the thing is, for us at least, um, Wales, it's going to be interesting to see if Mancini, the coach, decides to go for a full team yeah. or decides to... Well, apparently, from what we're saying tonight on TV, um, there's going to be quite a, quite a, quite a turnover. heavy tur- turnover. Um, at Mancini in the press conference talked about three, four players, but according to the latest rumors, it's going to be more like seven or eight. Which so, wouldn't be a surprise, right? yeah. Because Wales will pull, put their full strength team out, and a win for Wales would put them top, right? Yeah. Uh, but actually, the funny thing is that they were talking about uh, some, <laughs> you know, match fi- not match fixing, but you know, when when you when you you agree to to share the points because well, yeah, because um, well, if Wales, because if Switzerland wins, they go at no, the same you, points with Wales. Uh, or, if or Wales so, loses, the, the thing the thing is that uh, uh, whoever comes first in this group. Uh, most likely will play in the alpha of the table that has Belgium and France, while the team that comes second will be in the other alpha of the table with uh, Portugal and Spain. And from what we've seen so far, it's probably easier to play with Portugal and Spain than to play with Belgium and France. You know? Yeah, the problem is, is you, don't, you don't even know if France are going to top the group. You know, there's so many. I think all you've got to do is just qualify, and yeah. at some point in the tournament, you're going to have to play some big teams. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah definitely. Them, you know, I, I think, and that's why I think for England, the key thing for me is momentum. If I'm Italy, if I'm Mancini, I, I yeah, I want to rotate a bit because I want to save some legs in my players, but I want to go and win. I don't want. Yeah. I don't want to draw. I don't want to lose. I want that third win. I want every other oh, team. Here. And, and I think you've got a, a very good squad. I think you, uh, well, at least a, a very good uh, first team and a, a couple of people off the bench to, you know. Yeah. Mm, to be That'd fair, be uh, uh, most of the major uh, nations haven't really played up to the standard we expected from them, most of them. Maybe Italy did and, and Belgium. Uh, but all the others played somewhat uh, under what we were expecting. You know? Yeah, mind um, you, Belgium. Belgium in the last game, they were struggling a lot. Uh, Belgium I mean, was only De Bruyne. It was De Bruyne who changed the whole game. And, and, Lukaku. and, Luka- and Lukaku. De Bruyne and Lukaku. The first both goals, mm. Lukaku built them up. Uh, he's he's been an absolute powerhouse. Sorry, uh, Milan fan. No. <laughs> It's it, trust me, he's, and, he's and, uh, at the Bruyne, yeah. And also, the Netherlands are playing quite well, uh, not incredibly yeah. well, but uh, but quite well. But we haven't really seen a uh, you know, t- a team like think about Croatia, they are they were in the final of the of the World Cup, 
and now they're a completely different team. Okay, Luka Modric is much older now, but uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's just a surprise that they're playing so badly. Oh, um, Portugal, uh, they they struggled with Hungary uh, up until the 80th minute, then they scored three goals in the last 10 minutes, but they struggled against Hungary, and now they were beaten pretty badly by by Germany. Um, so they they they've been underperforming as well, and and, and not to mention Spain or England, you know. Um, I think my 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 minnows who I I think are going to cause trouble are Ukraine. I think they do. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I, I think they're doing very well, um, and they can score goals. Uh, and you know, I, I think um, people had like Turkey down with dark horses, Denmark, and Ukraine may you know may go deep into this tournament. Uh, it's going to be tricky. And, and, you know, think about the Greece in 2004. Yeah, 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 exactly. Anything can happen in a tournament. So who's, uh, who's likely to... Uh, let me see. I was just a uh, just curiosity. I was looking at the uh, Euro 2020 predictor. Um, so so who's going to... In the Russia group... Uh, let me see. Who's going to who's gonna finish second, do you reckon? Russia? Uh, uh, so provided, provided Belgium will be first. You know, uh, who do you think will be second? Russia, Finland, or Denmark? I Denmark. think Denmark. They're, Denmark, they're out pretty much. They yeah. Could be the, yeah. So it's either Russia or Finland, right? Denmark would have to 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 win by at least four goals, no more. Yeah, it's unli- unlikely. So no, yeah, by at least three goals because goal difference it's minus two. I don't know if they uh-huh. do goal difference or, but they could still be one of the best thirds. <laughs> I think Russia. No, I was I was looking. Uh, I mean, at, at least according to my prediction. But uh, I was looking that uh, talking about Italy. If Italy were to qualify first, most likely they would play against, as I said, in the same alpha as, as Belgium and France. But their mm-hmm. first game, first get knockout game, would be Ukraine. Uh, while if they were to qualify second and Wales first, most likely their first knockout game would be Russia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I I agree with with um, or, or Finland, but I agree with uh, with what Asan says. I'd rather play Russia than than Ukraine right now. Yeah. Anyway, oh, very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, it's getting late here. I know it's probably later in uh, in Italy, but uh, great to uh, go through the event with you guys, and um, yeah, we'll see you in a few days. We'll see you in a few days. All right. Hopefully, hopefully so, Italy and England go through. Let's. Well, Italy are already through, so <laughs> we can join you. <laughs> awesome. All right. Have a good night, guys. See you later. Take care. Good night.